Thanks. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Grace and the Lord. What a joy to have you with me today. Uh, I pray you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving, an opportunity to spend some time with family and friends, enjoy some good food. Most importantly, we reflect on the blessings God has given you and give Him thanks. It's a joy to have you here today. And we're starting a new series as we enter into this Christmas holiday season. An opportunity to reflect on our Savior and the gift that God gives to us in Jesus Christ. And what a tremendous blessing that is. We enter into this season called Advent. And Advent has this idea of preparing for something. Something that's coming. And so we spend these few weeks during the hecticness and the busyness of this holiday season to really focus on what's important as our Savior Jesus, and that's what we're going to be doing. So hopefully you grab a handout on your way in this, evening, this morning. This will help you walk through our, our reading for today and, and our time in God's Word. We're going to be looking at a series called She Shouldn't Be Here. And it's kind of an interesting title for a series, but what we're going to do over the next number of weeks is take a look at some of the women who are a part of Jesus' line, the family line of Jesus and they're women that maybe you wouldn't expect to see. Maybe they led scandalous lives. Maybe they, they didn't have what it takes. And yet God chose them and placed them in a special place to be a part of the Savior's family life. A very special part of the promise that God has for you and me. It's going to be a powerful reflection on our place at the manger too. Because as we look forward to coming into the stable and once again standing next to the manger and seeing Jesus, that may be born to us, we too will sometimes question, do we deserve to be there? I hope these next weeks will help us prepare and see we do have a spot, because we belong. So let's begin with, uh, with our opening song as we come together to worship our Lord. I invite our musicians to come on up and invite you to stand and to join in singing as you feel comfortable. Oh, come on, come on. 
As we long for our Savior's coming and, and sing of his coming, O come, O come, Emmanuel, we are reminded of the need for that Savior. The need to come before our God with humble hearts because we have not led perfect lives. And yet we get to come together as people of God to stand in his presence today and know that his promise was fulfilled for you and for me for the forgiveness of our sins. So let's take a moment as we enter into our worship today to confess humbly our sin before our Lord and to receive the beautiful promise and assurance that you are forgiven for the sake of Jesus. Join with me in the, the bold response this year. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trust in me and my prayer. God have mercy on me. A sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, to be the uh, Jesus Christ who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's join together and sing the next song, My Soul in Stillness. <laughs> Thank you. 
37. As I mentioned, over these next few weeks, we're going to take a look at three Old Testament women. Women who you would maybe not expect, once we dive into their story, that they would have been a part of this beautiful light of promise to send Savior into this world. And yet God used them, God chose them, and God placed them. We're going to look at Sarah, the wife of Abraham. We're going to look at a woman named Rahab, who lived in Jericho during the time when Israel was coming back from being slaves in, in, in Egypt to take over the land that God had promised. And then Ruth, a foreigner who followed her widowed mother-in-law to a foreign land, a new land, and, and there found God's grace. So today we're going to start with Sarah. Her husband is probably one of the more famous believers in, the, in throughout the Bible. Her husband was Abraham. He's often referred to as the father of faith. And now you might be wondering, well, if Abraham is the father of faith, well, then obviously Sarah did belong. Well, we're going to take a look today at the account of Sarah and how she was brought into a part of the promise and see that she had her own challenges and struggles too. And yet God blessed her through. But before we go too far into the story of Sarah, I want you to think about belonging. Right? And picture this scenario. Maybe this is a scenario you're going to be experiencing here as this holiday season and parties are coming up and things like that. First thing I want you to think about is this. A company hosts a Christmas party, and when the time comes and everyone is gathering, it's clear that someone there doesn't belong. Come up with reasons that would identify why that person should not be at the party. Right? So you got a party crasher at your Christmas party. How do you know that that person doesn't belong? Come up with a list. I know it's kind of just a general scenario. But what things would tip you off that that person doesn't belong? Take a few moments, think about it, talk about it with somebody you're, you're uh, sitting next to, and we'll share some thoughts in just a moment. <laughs> So what are some identifying factors that show you someone doesn't belong at the Christmas party? What things do you come up with? asking, well, do you know him? Well, I don't know him, right? Um, maybe it's someone that just got fired, and 
shouldn't be at the Christmas party. It's just awkward, right? <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, the person who just got fired shows up at the, the Christmas party. Um, maybe someone tries to get in, but they don't have the invitation. All right, so that's a, a tell all. Oh, they're not dressed in the right way. Uh, maybe it's someone that you know works for the competition. <laughs> You're wondering what the world are you doing at our Christmas party? Or maybe they didn't bring a gift. Here's the biggest time on it security is chasing after them. They probably don't belong, right? So you get this. There are lots of reasons and, and factors that you might look at and say, Dad, you just don't belong here. And, and you get how that can feel. It can feel awkward. It can bring down the party sometimes even. Um, you just feel out of place, especially maybe if you're the one who doesn't belong. Maybe you've gone to a party where you were an invited guest uh, with, or you were you were like tag along uh, with someone, and you didn't really know anybody else, and that can just feel like you don't belong. It feels a little weird, a little different, a little awkward. Sometimes I feel like that's the way it can be in our relationship with God. When we think about Christmas time, when we think about going to the manger and celebrating the reason for Christmas and the holiday, sometimes don't you step back and just maybe feel like, this is all great, but I just don't know if this is my place. That maybe God hasn't invited me. Or maybe I, I just feel awkward when I'm gathered with other Christians or when I start thinking about Christmas. Or maybe you look at somebody else and you wonder, well, I don't know if they belong all those thoughts and reasons are why we need to spend some time with God in His Word. Because the reality is God extends an invitation for all of us to celebrate the birth of the Savior. Why? Because God gives that gift to you. And today we're going to take a look at that. And we're going to see through the life of Sarah how God used her in a special way, even though it seems like she maybe shouldn't have been there. So let's dive into the life of Sarah. Uh, before I go too far, though, just a little bit of the background. Abraham and his wife Sarah... We're living in the, in the land of, like, Turkey today, right? If you can picture where Turkey is in the, in the Middle East, that's kind of where they were living. And God called out to Abraham in, in kind of a vision and said, Abraham, I want you to follow where I want you to go and trust me that I'm going to make you into this great big nation. And you know what Abraham did? He followed him. I don't know how many of you would have done that. If, if somebody says, hey, I want you to go to this new land, you've never been there, I want you to leave your family and everything that you're comfortable with and that you know, your job and all that, and I want you to relocate to this foreign land, you've never been there before, just follow me and trust me it's all going to be good. That's asking a lot, isn't it? But that's exactly what Abraham and his wife Sarah did. They settled in the land of, of Israel, where Israel is today. And throughout this, God said, I'm going to make you into this great nation, you're going to be you're going to be a blessing to all people. But then time goes on. And Abraham and Sarah are not young people. And if they're going to be a great nation, guess what you have to have? You've got to have kids, right? You can't have future generations if you don't have some kids to pass it on. And they had not had any children. Abraham and Sarah were dealing with infertility. And it seemed like it was never going to happen. But God didn't forget, and he came to Abraham in a very special way and said, Abraham, you are going to have a child. I'm going to provide it, even in your old age. And that's where we're jumping in today. We have an account where the Lord appeared to Abraham with a couple of angels in, in human form, sat down, had a meal with them, and reinforced this promise that he was going to have a child. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 18. If you'd like to open up your Bibles or smartphones to um, that passage, you're welcome to do that. Have it up here for the moment while we read through it. So these angels and the Lord have just confirmed the promise that Abraham, you are going to have a son. We're going to come back in a year. You're going to have a child. Let's see how Sarah reacts to this. Where is your wife Sarah? The visitors asked him. Well, they're in the tent, Abraham said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. 
Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. This portion of God's word sets the stage for this account of Sarah. Now she's going to fit into this whole picture. Um, but it gives us some reasons right off the bat as to why maybe it seems like Sarah didn't really belong. So all you need to do is just take a moment, reflect on those verses that we just read, and make a list of things that would make it seemingly unlikely for Sarah to be included in the family line of the Savior. So see what you can come up with, and we'll share some thoughts together in just a moment. Uh, we'll give you a, a moment to think about it, and maybe chat with someone to say next. <coughs> So what are you seeing here as reasons why Sarah maybe didn't belong in the line of the family, the family line of the Savior? Anything jump out at you? She lacked trust in him. She lacked trust in him, and, and how do you how do you see her lacking trust here? Uh, she doubted when he said, "Hey, you're going to have some next year." Yeah. She doubted it. She laughed about it. Have you got to be kidding me, right? That's that's not possible. But she thought it was a joke or impossible, right? Good. So she lacked trust. What else? You might think that if God wanted her involved, he would have involved her when she was younger. She could raise him. Yeah, this is a this is a young couple's game, right? Not not Abraham and Sarah are pushing a hundred and ninety here, respectively, right? They're old. We're told she's past childbearing years. This should not be possible. All right? Um, another reason why it didn't seem like she belongs. She can't have kids anymore. She's too old for this. All right? Other reasons why maybe she doesn't belong. Please. Yeah, earlier in the, this story, uh, Abraham and Sarah get sick of waiting, right? And so they say, well, maybe Abraham is supposed to have a, a, a child with her maiden, her handmaiden, right? And Abraham does, they have a child named Ishmael, but that was not the way God intended it. And now he says it's going to come through here. So here, that's another piece of the background that makes it sound like she doesn't belong. And at the end here, God asks her if she's, if she, why she laughed, and she said, well, I didn't laugh. Come on. <laughs> right? You're lying to God. Doesn't seem like the kind of person you would expect to be in the line of the, the family line of the Savior. Sarah had challenges. And I think that for us, as we look at this, it's important for us to realize something. You know, we can read through the Bible and we can think about all these people, these characters Abraham, Noah, Sarah, Jacob, Isaac, David, and think about, man, these are all people that, that were godly people that, that had the heart of God, but when we really dive into them, they all had their weaknesses. They all had their, their troubles and their trials. And Sarah, too. 
It's a reminder because I know that there's not a single person in here who's perfect. And we each come before God's broken people who have our weaknesses and our mistakes too. And it's good to know that God still has a place for us. Because sometimes we can be just like Sarah. Sometimes we can just laugh at God when we hear something that he has for us. So the next thing I want you to do is to think about that. It's a little time for personal reflection and also to, to think uh, about these things too. But uh, what promises or words of God have you laughed at? Just think about it. I, I don't necessarily, won't necessarily ask you to share unless you're willing to, but just think about it personally. What are promises or words of God that I have laughed at in unbelief or doubt? And more importantly then, why do people laugh at God's promises? Take a moment to reflect on that, share some thoughts and ideas with one another, and we'll come back again. Jesus was surrounded by a crowd of, of people, included were his disciples, uh, religious leaders of the people of Israel, and, and just common people who were there to hear Jesus, to see the things he was going to do, all that kind of stuff. And Jesus declared to them, I am the Son of God. And you know what the religious leaders did? They laughed at him. They scoffed. And they mocked him. They didn't believe him. He didn't look the, the role that they were expecting. Because in their minds, they had heard God's promises. He's going to send a Savior. He's going to send the Messiah. The Anointed One is going to come and redeem Israel. He's going to restore Israel. And in their minds, that meant that they were going to become this great big nation again. So the Messiah, he's got to be this, this strong, powerful, well-spoken guy who is just going to you know, attract all the crowds and he's going to speak against the Romans and he is going to set up a rebellion and take over and create this powerful nation. And Jesus did not fit that bill. So when he said, I'm the Son of God, I'm the Savior, they laughed at him. I could tell you a whole bunch of other stories just from the, the pages of Scripture of people that laughed at God and His promises, but you get this because you laugh at God and His word and promises at times too. Anybody willing to share a promise or a word of God that you sometimes laugh at? Please. Well, I think of Jeremiah 29. Um, for I know the plans I have for you, it's like the Lord's plans to prosper you and not to harm you. But when I'm in the trenches, I'm thinking, I'm running out of hope and this hurts. So I find myself laughing at that, but I, I cling to it because I know it's going to work out. But when you're in the trenches, it, it's hard. So you hear God's promises, I am with you, I will care for you, I have a plan for you, but that's really hard. Maybe laugh at that when you're in the middle of the trials and the troubles of this life. 
really God? You got this? You're with me? Because it doesn't seem like it right now. Other words or promises of God that you sometimes find yourself laughing at? Please. Uh, whenever there is, like, say, an example of uh, the tragic young death, uh, you know, like some, like, some kid gets cancer, they live, you know, barely three years, and that's supposed to be, oh, that was his plan. Like, real nice plan there. I'm sure that was fair. I'm sure that kid did something to, you know, it's, you know, like, those are harder to understand, you know, the why that was the appropriate uh, plan of his. Right. When we wrestle with unexpected death, untimely things, tragedy in our world, we could reflect on maybe a, the, the tragedy that took place in Waukesha last week, and then ask God, well, why? I thought you are in control of all things. Why are you doing this? It doesn't seem like you've got the right plan. Other times where you let me laugh at God's words and promises. Maybe it's times when you're reflecting on your sin, or when you're caught in temptation, and once again, guilt is over, over, overpowering you, and, and you are over, overwhelmed and burdened by it, and you're thinking, seriously, God, there's no way you can forgive me this time. I know you've said it, and you've taken me to the cross, but you can't forgive a crummy sinner like me. And you laugh. But most importantly, you recognize the times you laugh, but more importantly, why do people laugh at God's words and promises? Thoughts? Because as humans, and let alone sinful humans, we're so narrow-focused that we can't see the big picture that God has planned, and that even if there is a lesson, and maybe we can understand that, we don't like going through it. We have such a narrow vision, I love that, thank you. Such narrow vision that sometimes all we see is the trouble, or the problem, or the mess that we've gotten into, and we miss seeing the bigger picture of what it really means. We laugh at God because we doubt. We laugh at God because it seems impossible that He could really have something important in mind for me, that He has purpose for me, that He has forgiveness for me, that heaven is there, that a Savior could die for me, and Satan just wants to work His way into our hearts and get us to doubt and unbelief and say it's too big, it's too impossible, there's no way that God can do it. And that's why Sarah was laughing too. She was laughing because she thought there is no possible way, there is no chance, God, that you can make this happen in my life. And so she laughed, she doubted, she didn't believe it. But I love how God responded. And if you look at verse 14, you'll see it. He says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? It wasn't just Sarah in her old age who God blessed with a child. If you look further on into the, the family line and into the big picture of God's promise of a Savior, there's two other women who maybe shouldn't have been there. Elizabeth, whose husband, Zechariah, was uh, a priest in the temple. Never had children either. Long for them, asked for them. It wasn't until they were well past childbearing age again that God said, I'm going to give you a child. And not just give you a child, but I'm going to give you a child who's going to prepare the way for the Savior. And they had a child named John. He's famously known as John the Baptist, the one who went out into the desert preaching that the Savior is here and is coming and he led people to Jesus. Another woman was her relative, a young woman named Mary. You know her famously as the mother of Jesus. But she shouldn't have been there. She shouldn't have been there. She was just about to get married, never been with a man. How is it possible she's going to become pregnant and have a baby and have a son of God? Well, again, God working miracles. Why? Because nothing is too hard for the Lord. And what a beautiful promise for you and me to think about. Because as we see here in this account of Abraham and Sarah, we have a God who is far bigger and more powerful than anything in the realm of nature or in redemption. If God can, can usurp the laws of nature in a biology and give an old woman who shouldn't have a child a child, God can do anything. And that means that He can truly forgive you for all of your sins. And that He can truly keep all of His promises that He is with you, even in the darkest, hardest of times of this life. And He can promise you that because of the blood of Jesus, which was shed for you on the cross, your sins, as heinous, as ugly, and as disgusting as they might be, and as often as they occur, they are all paid for, wiped out, because Jesus died, and we know it because He rose again. We don't need to laugh at God in His promise. <coughs> because we know that He is faithful. And that in Christ, 
His promises are all fulfilled. Now for Sarah, she at that moment didn't quite know that and understand that. But God is going to prove it to her. And we're going to see how that changed her heart and life. So let's go to the next portion of God's Word. This is a little uh, further on, chapter 21. A little bit of an interlude, obviously, because she did become pregnant. And nine months later, had a child, and they named him Isaac. Let's read the account of this Genesis chapter 21. <clears throat> now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant, and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son that Sarah bore him. And when his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. A hundred years old. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in this old age. The promise that God had given to Abraham and Sarah many years before the very beginning of their journey and reiterated again a year earlier now comes to fulfillment. Look at the account and these words of God here. And just reflect on them, meditate on them for just a moment. And identify a phrase or two that catches your attention in those verses. Show why they catch your attention. I think there's some pretty cool and amazing things just in this these few verses here. So I'm going to have the words up here again on the screen. Take a moment, reflect on them, meditate on them, what jumps out of you, and why. So what words or phrases jumped out at you as you reflected on those verses? As unbelievable as the promise seemed, it all happened just as God promised. And not just as he promised, but in the time that God knew. And I think that's another beautiful thing, that God in his timing brings about fulfillments of his promises. 
And, and here it was. And this was not the way Abraham and Sarah would have had, had their family plan go. Right? That they would have kids when they were 100 years old. That makes me terrified to think they have kids at 100. Right? I love my kids now. And then it would be hard enough you know, at this age. Right? Um, God blesses though in his time. And this was the blessing he had for them in that time. What else jumps out at you in those verses? Please. Just something that was on. Yeah. She talks about laughter. There's there's laughter, but I think in a new perspective. We're going to talk about that in just a moment, so I'm not going to comment on that uh, any more than that. But yeah, the laughter piece comes back into this. The very thing that we started with is here again. We're going to compare that in just a moment. Anything else that jumps out at you, catches your attention? Yeah. I think the first verse, the Lord was gracious to Sarah, and he did for Sarah. I feel like I can put my name in for Sarah, and God gracious to me. The Lord was gracious to him. And that means he had undeserved love for her, love that she didn't deserve, love that she didn't earn. And especially after her reaction to a beautiful promise, you're going to have a child, and she laughed at him and lied to him about it. And yet God was still gracious to her. And God is still gracious to us too. And I think all the things that jump out at you are things that, that apply to you in your life, too. God is gracious to you each and every day, and especially even in those moments when we are not deserving of God's goodness and His mercy and His love. He's still gracious to you. He still shines on you each day and blesses you with the things you need and shares that wonderful promise that, you know what, today you are still forgiven. You're still God's child. And in these things where God has said, I will fulfill my promise, and just as we see it, He fulfilled it in just the way He promised at just the right time, God promises that in your life too. You can read every portion of God's Word, every word that is written in the Bible, and know that it is true and is faithful. It is another proof of it. And that means that God is going to fulfill all He's given you. All the promises to be with you, to forgive you, to give you purpose, to give you gifts to serve one another, to grow in faith, and to one day be with Him in heaven. Those are all promises God sets before you. They're all faithful because of His Son, Jesus. And He'll fulfill them at just the right time. And so sometimes we need to step back and pray, Lord, open my eyes to see the promises before me. Give me a heart that trusts you, the heart that follows you, even in the challenging times, the heart that relies on you. And holds on to your promises. And God will answer that. Because that's a prayer he loves to hear. And loves to answer to you. Now as Jeremy pointed out. Um, Sarah has some more laughter here in this section. And what I want you to do is to reflect on that. And evaluate Sarah's laughter in this <laughs> section. Compared to her laughter earlier in the section we saw in chapter 18. So compare the two. Evaluate them. And, uh, and see how, how they... How they work, how they're maybe different, and or the same. I'll give you a moment to do that. So let's talk about this laughter. She laughed at the beginning because 
Uh, or, uh, I don't want to answer the question for you. Let's evaluate it. How do you, how do you see your laughter at the beginning now compared to your child being born? Same, different, what do you think? Go ahead, Jack. Uh, it's that classical prepositional difference between laughing at and laughing with. Okay. And really, you know, one of those that kind of degree the negative connotation, whether it's yet uh, disbelief or mocking, and then the laughing with is usually a, a communal enjoyment of uh, something great that's happened or funny. Or, you know, Absolutely. Kind of thing, I guess. So maybe laughing at, not believing, now laughing with, enjoying it. Right? Good. Other thoughts on um, how we would compare her laughter in the two spots? Jack summed it up maybe so beautifully for us, right? This first, the first laugh was a laugh of unbelief. A laugh of, this is impossible. I don't believe it. I doubt it. There's no way ever that this is going to happen. But now we see the change in laughter, don't we? And no longer is it a laughter of unbelief, but is a laughter of joy. It is a laughter of, of trust. It's a laughter of belief, of, of promise fulfilled. And what caused the change? Well, it's seeing God's promise being fulfilled in her life. Seeing God's graciousness to her. The blessing that God had given to her. You see, when we see God's promise and we know the fulfillment of it, we know how God works in our lives, it changes us, doesn't it? It changes our hearts. And in those challenging moments in life when we just want to laugh at God and say, no way, I don't believe it, I doubt you, God shines in our lives. And I don't know if it's an answer to a prayer, if it's a change of the situation, or maybe it's just a reiterating of His promise in His word, and the Spirit works in our hearts, but it changes us, doesn't it? And no longer do we laugh in unbelief and doubt and maybe even fear that nervous laugh, right? But we laugh in joy. We laugh because we know God is with us and it's a laughter of enjoyment. It's a laughter of inclusion. It's a laughter of promises being fulfilled. It's knowing that God is faithful to us and it's, it's a laughter of repentance and joy and forgiveness. All those things that are wrapped up in it. A laughter that we share with God. I think the angels in heaven laugh with us too as we, we marvel at the beauty of God's blessings for us. The marvel of the beauty of a Savior born to rescue us from sin and death. You know, I, I think it's obvious we would look at Sarah as a woman that, yeah, maybe she didn't belong, but she did have a place. And God made her into the, the mother of this great nation, mother of a promise. Because he's faithful, and he's gracious, and he's kind, and he's good. And God gives us a place in that play, and that, that role too. A place at the manger, a place to be there. Because God is just as gracious in his promises to you. I want to leave you with this passage from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Uh, chapter 11 is sometimes referred to as the great chapter of faith. And here we find Sarah. Who we look at and think, man, she doesn't belong, she's too old, she can't have kids, she's laughing and lying at God. And yet here she is listed as a person of faith. And here's why. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sand on the seashore. It seemed impossible that Abraham and Sarah would ever become a great nation, but God promised. And God chose them out of His graciousness to be the beginning. And out of that one child that they had came this nation of believers and people that you and me more numerous than the seas, the sand on the seashore, the stars in the sky. That's an amazing thing. Why? Because nothing is too hard for the Lord. And it's because Sarah believed in Him. She considered Him faithful who had made the promise. She trusted. And by faith, her life was changed. And I pray that you too can trust in the promises of God and find Him to be faithful and that your hearts and lives can be changed too as we reflect on the goodness of our God. Let's join together in praying this morning for the graciousness of our God. Is there anything on your hearts and minds that you'd like to include in prayer today? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we admit that too often we don't feel like we belong. And especially by the way that we live our lives, we show that we don't necessarily belong in a relationship with you as people to receive the promises that you set before us and to, to be a part of the wonderful inheritance of eternal life. 
And yet, as you remind us through the life of Sarah and her husband Abraham, you can do the impossible, and you do that for us. Because nothing's too hard for you, Lord. Instill that within our hearts today. That you have forgiven us of all of our sins, and you will help us and lead us away from temptation and guard us uh, against sin. That you will give us uh, a way out of this sinful world, and you will bring us from the troubles one day. Lord, give us faith and trust in that. Build us up, and in those dark and troubling times, shine the light and the brightness of your goodness into our hearts and lives and strengthen us with that faith. Lord, we entrust to you all the problems of, of this life and all the sorrows that we run across each day. We thank you for the blessings that you too graciously give us each morning. We ask that you be with us as we go into your world this week. May we serve you with graciousness and kindness. Teach us and lead us to forgive those who hurt and harm us, to show your love and mercy to others. And give us opportunity, Lord, through our words and our actions and the way we love, to show your peace and your mercy to many others. Watch over us and bless us, Lord, in our communities to support and encourage one another. And, and Lord, bring us all together to hear your words soon again. That we may grow together and we can remain focused during this holiday season on our Savior Jesus. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. I invite you to join together with me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We'll close our time together this morning with a last hymn called Savior of the Nations Come. Might you stand and to join in singing as you feel comfortable.
to join and have you with us today. Uh, a few things to, to keep in mind, especially here at Grace and the Lord as we celebrate the, the Christmas season. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, on December 12th, we will be going out and singing Christmas carols in the third ward here. So right after our service here, about noon, uh, we'll gather together. We're just going to walk up and down the street, maybe go to the public market to see what it's like. And just sing Christmas hymns, Christmas carols, uh, hand out Christmas invites. It's always a fun time. Uh, we'll usually go out for a uh, half hour, 45 minutes, whatever you can offer to us. And whether you've got a great voice or not such a great voice, it doesn't matter. You know how to sing, and it's kind of fun to do. So, we'll be doing that, and then our Christmas service here in the ward will be on the 19th. So, it'll be our opportunity to celebrate Christmas, sing the Christmas song, reflect on the Christmas story, uh, celebrate the goodness of our God. Uh, do take a peek at the things in your worship folder. You have grace notes, some different things happening at, uh, at Grace that we're welcome to be a part of, and then also the connect card. We'd love for you to fill that up, drop it off, so we can stay connected to you. Other than that, uh, may God richly bless your day today, and uh, keep you here. Enjoy your week. Oh yeah, it is. It was, uh, it was in the. They have it in the sport, so cool. I can maybe then try it out too. Yeah, yeah, because we'll see you in a few weeks then. Yeah, uh, see you. Because uh, cool. Yeah. All right.
that piece there, but you necessarily have time to do it. Right. So it's going to be spaced out. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, two, two, two. I guess I'm doing
needs to be submitted and things like that. So you, you'd have to still finish yeah. some, some of it, but the paper will work on the back end of things. Yeah, I think so. Well, yeah. I might just do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.